Um, second premise. Thanks. Traditional communities do not often voluntarily give up or sell the resources on which their communities are based until their communities have been destroyed. They also do not willingly allow their land bases to be damaged so that other resources, gold, oil, and so on, can be extracted. It follows that those who want the resources will do what they can to destroy traditional communities. Third premise. Our way of living, industrial civilization, is based on requires what collapse very quickly without persistent widespread violence. Blah, 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 blah. And it defines civilization in there, too. I, I guess I'll go into that for a second. That I've been bashing civilization for about 10 years. And, and when I wrote this book, it's like, geez, I better finally define it. And so the definition that I use is civilization is a way of life characterized by the growth of cities. And that's defensible historically, linguistically, everything. C civilization comes from the root civitatos, which means city. OK, that's fine, Derek, but what's a city? I have to find a city as a collection, not a community, but a collection of people living in numbers large enough to require the importation of resources. So under this definition, the Talawa, on whose land I now live, were not civilized because they lived in villages, camps. They did not require the importation of resources. Two things happen as soon as you require the importation of resources. One is that your way of life can never be sustainable. Because if you require the importation of resources, and I'm not talking about trading shells for buffalo robes, because that's not requiring. That's, that's simple economic transaction. That's true free trade. Um, but if you require the importation of resources, that means you've denuded the landscape of that resource. And so as your city grows, you will denude an ever larger area. The second thing it means is that if you require the importation of resources, your way of living must be based on violence. Because if you require the importation of resources, trade will never be sufficiently reliable. Because if the people in the next watershed over, if you need something from their watershed and they won't trade, trade you for it and you need it, you will take it. Which means we could all become junior bodhisattvas and the US military would still have to invade countries all over the world to get our oil. And so I go through the premise and I want to say one more thing, which is that, um, and you, you, you sort of gave me a look about the word we and our and said that was important. And one of the most important things I think we can do, this has to do with the whole identification thing, is to start by paying attention to when we say we. And I had a friend the other day say, how much longer do you think we're going to be in Iraq? And I said, <laughs> I thought we were in Northern California. Um, and then the friend said, no, 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 our troops. I said, I've got troops? <laughs> Shit. I mean, OK, so can I, can I move back to, to the Columbia River? Um, <coughs> And the friend said, you know what I mean. And it's like, no, what? You, have, you have troops. Are they yours? And I mean, so, so I think it's really important that we stop saying our culture, actually. It's the dominant culture, um, whatever. We stop identifying with it. It's not our government. And it's never been our government. And that doesn't mean the whole voting thing. People sometimes ask me if, if I'm going to vote. And I always respond that. We all have secret vices that we're ashamed of. And you know, some people use drugs. Some people really you know, compulsively masturbate or something. And I, I vote, you know? I'm sorry. Uh, they wind you up, and there you go. <laughs> uh, Energizer bunny. Well, it's, it's, it's not as fun as masturbation, but. I agree. <laughs> um, we should probably stop this line of. Um, Immediately. Yeah. Um, I, guess I, I recognize it's useless, but it's, it's still, I mean, it's something to do. I mean, I live in a small town, what can I say? I mean, I laugh. You know, I turn on the TV and I watch and I laugh. Okay. Um, God, what was your original question? Uh, if there was a, the concept of the violence only going downwards. Which oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's in the new book, and it's one of the premises. The title? The title right now is Endgame, The Collapse of Civilization, Rebirth of Community. Um, end game, but it's probably not going to be that in a, in a year. I mean, the, the publishers will decide it. They, they always. The negative title. The, yeah, the publishers. Is that true with your books, too? The Who publishers choose titles? No. <laughs> no way. Huh. They're free to suggest. But you have final say over that? You bet. Okay, I'm going to start doing that. Yeah. <laughs> You'll end up with better titles. How about the cover? Do you, do, do you have veto over cover, too? Yeah, I got veto. I used to sort of. Better agent. Yeah, I got better book designers working now, so I don't I don't tend to be as directly involved, but I got approval, so okay. assist on it. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Okay.
they're doing things to protect our security. <laughs> we need that to feel secure. Who's the we whose security is being protected here and from whom? I'm just going to leave that one. I've got other people. Actually, she had to go to another meeting and had a woman here that's authoring a book on that. And it's real interesting. I'm not writing the book, so I can't give you the precision on the quote, but there's some famous writer that's sometimes referring to the West, somewhere around Denver, Colorado, said, the funny thing is, there is no there there. And that's what she sort of discovered. Ultimately, you peel this onion, there's nothing there, including even the people you would expect. It's the antithesis of what it purports to be. And that, that's a really insidious part of this we and our kind of thing that they've got even I do it, and I'm otherwise perfect. <laughs> no, it, it, it really is. They get you buying into things semantically. If you can conceive it that way, it really, really takes the edges off your ability to frame things sharply. And you have to frame them sharply, clearly, in order to know what it is you have to do to get where you want to go. Um, I want to say one more thing about that. Um, I want to say one more thing about that, which is, um, after the end of apartheid, or the nominal end, whatever we want to say, um, that one of the heads of South African security, um, secret police, I guess is, is more accurate, um, said what he had been most afraid of from the ANC was not their sabotage nor even their violence, but the possibility that they would um, convince the mass of South Africans to not believe in law and order because if they didn't police themselves, no security force in the world could contain that. And that was the single most important thing that he was afraid of. Craig Williams, yeah. You know, the source where I had didn't name it. I think it was him. Um, I, I need everybody to excuse me, because I kind of have a, like, I got to get going. Um, I want to ask Derek a personal question related to what you wrote in um, the language book. Um, and your crumb proceeding. Um, you heard a voice you said saying let go. Do you remember writing that? Um, let go, Derek. I oh keep going. Well I was wondering what if you've learned what it was you needed to let go of. Um, and maybe this ties in with what the other gentleman was saying about the stage. Like I think the stage is comfort. And I think Maybe that pertains to what the other woman was asking, like, um, what do we do? I don't think there would be that question in America if people were willing to suffer for what they believe in. Um, I was just wondering if you've had any more insight. You said that Crohn's disease was a teacher, and um, you suffered a lot calling all those hives around. Like, that work brought you down. It brought you to a place of being teachable. like. It humbled you, and I don't think, I don't think like you would have learned anything if you hadn't gotten brought in love. And um, I think Americans are really proud; and they need to humble themselves, like this American pride thing, you know. Like um, it's something I've been dealt with. Like I've had, like I realize I have these issues too. But like, what have you learned, Derek, since you wrote that? Well, I, I think I have three responses. The first one is that um, in my own particular life, the thing that I had to let go of was that um, I, I've heard it said that a lot of people who get abused either end up abusing others or abusing themselves. And my own direction was to turn it inward. And um, I was to use, I, I, I can probably, yeah, I, I, I was repressed. Um, I didn't feel anger. I didn't feel any of those weird emotion things. And um, one of the things that, and, and I would not, I would turn pain off. Um, I broke my jump foot. I was a high jumper, as you know. And I broke my jump foot, and I just kept jumping. And I jumped 6'6 six, six on a broken jump foot. Um, I, would, I, would, I would hop up to, the, to my mark, and then I would turn it off, and I would jump. And then I would hurt like hell afterwards. 
Um, I broke my hand playing softball. I finished the game. I broke my foot playing football. I finished the game. Pretty fucking stupid. And the reason is because I, I turned everything off. And the, one of the big lessons that the Crohn's disease taught me was that if I can't control whether I go to the bathroom, there's not much in my life I can control. And it was really an opening for me to start letting go, to start feeling. I mean, if I can't beat, there was part of it too, is I could beat anything. And if I can't beat this disease, then I need to get up, give up on the notion of beating things. And, or to give up on the notion of, that's not, that's not entirely true because, because there are things that are worth fighting for. I mean, it's not a black and white thing or an open and shut thing, but the point is it taught me to stop attempting to maintain that level of self-control. That's one thing. Another thing it did is it killed me. And that's a wonderful thing. The central metaphor of all my work is death and rebirth. Because one of the, a wonderful thing happens, for example, when you give up on hope, which is that you realize that kind of like a Christian heaven, you never needed it in the first place. And, and a, you realize that when you give up on hope, also, no, when you give up on hope, that the part of you that relied on it is now dead. And once you're dead, the logic of the Nazis doesn't work anymore. They can't touch you anymore once you're dead. You can still sing, and you can still dance, and you can still make love, and you can still fight like hell, but they can't touch you. And so that's the second thing. And the third thing is, oh, I think one of the, one of the most important things that the one of the ways that the civilized have been able to steal the land from the indigenous, apart from the fact that they just slaughtered them wherever they could, is that they would many times demoralize them. And one of the ways that would happen is if you burn a village once, they rebuild it. You burn it again, they rebuild it. You burn it again, they rebuild it. You burn it again, they, you burn it again, they say, fuck it. I'm not fighting this anymore. I can't do it. I give up. And I mean, that's happened in my own life about many things. And I think one of the most important things that we need to do is to attempt to demoralize the Americans, um, to, to get them to break their unshakable faith in the current system so that when you turn on the tap water, you know it's going to go on. When you turn on the computer, you know it's going to go on. But what happens if you turn it on, if you try to turn it on and water doesn't come out? Well, fuck. OK, it's going to come on a little while. What happens if it goes off again? Well, fuck. It's going to come on again. What happens if it goes off again and again and again and again? I think one of the things we have to do is to break their faith in the current system, to break their religious belief in the mm -hmm. current system. Well, so I, so I, I, I guess whoever takes out the wires should take out the, the cell phone tower at the same time. Like it should be coordinated. So when they call the complaint, <laughs> well, I want to say well, yes, oh, sure. And, 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 I want to say one more thing about about taking out water supplies. <coughs> when the dams on the Colorado River eventually fail, whether humans cause them to or whether s someone else causes them to, um, if civilization is still standing and if the capitalist press is still running at that point, it will of course bray that the people in Southern California and Nevada and Arizona are really thirsty. That's bullshit. More than 90% of the water used by, by humans is used for agriculture and industry. And if the dams on the Colorado River go, I don't want to hear one word of complaint out of anybody so long as there exists a single golf course, a single um, alfalfa field, a single swimming pool, a single lawn. Once those are gone, and if people are still thirsty, then we can complain about it. That has nothing to do with Crohn's disease. <laughs> it's the result of Crohn's disease. Yeah, I mean, Crohn's disease taught me that. I think there was a woman with a question in the far back. Yeah, some more. OK, I guess not. Um, and how are we doing for time now? Five minutes. Yeah.